together so it, uh, it followed me to run a little bit behind. I didn't set this thing up like I normally do. Be bad. All right, James chapter 1. James chapter 1 is about a faith that what? Works. Not a works faith, but a faith that works. Some of the some of the people years ago when they were doing the canonization of the scriptures, they did not want to include the book of James. And one of those that didn't want it in their uh, period was Martin Luther. Martin Luther, he came out of the Roman Catholic Church because of their teaching of a, a works faith, uh, a salvation. And he did that verse of scripture that... Uh, were justified by faith is what brought him out. And uh, he thought his teaching worked. But it's not. It's talking about something that works in your life. I thank God when you get saved, it works. If you get saved and it doesn't work, and you need to take it back to the shop that you bought it to and get one that does work. All right? It works. It changes your life. Uh, we've been leaving a lot of things. I'm going to look at two verses uh, tonight. Uh, verse or three, actually. Uh, verse number 9, 10, 11. I'm going to read these. Then we're going to go back and look at them in their context. We're going to look at what they say. We're going to look at what they do not say. But it said, Let the brother of low degree rejoice in that he is exalted. But the rich... I want to add something. It does not hurt you. Scripture is implied. All right? It's understood. But let the rich rejoice in that he's made love. Because as the flower of the grass, he shall pass away. For the sun is no sooner risen with the burning heat, but it withereth the grass, and the flower thereof falleth, and the grace of the fashion of it perisheth, so also shall the rich man fade in his ways. Now, I want to look at these verses a few minutes. One, I want to read into them what they don't say. And sometimes you can, uh, you know what God says by what God does not say. So he's, he's going to, I'm going to lighten just a little bit, give you some help. One, he's talking about the brother of low degree. When we talk about low degree, he's not talking about look down on. We live in days, and by the way, uh, socialism makes a caste system. How many know what a caste system is? Uh, you go to Mexico, let's look at Mexico just for a minute. You have the very rich, you have the middle class, and you have the very poor. The very rich is small, the middle class is small. The very poor is great. But what happens is a young boy or a young girl normally raised in one of these countries, say you're raised in the lower class, it doesn't matter how beautiful the young lady, how smart the young lady, how handsome the young man, how smart the young man, it is hard for him to elevate out of that class. It's virtually impossible to do so. Socialism makes a caste system. You got your rich, you got the poor, they squeeze out the middle class, and everybody's kind of locked in, right? Now, he's talking about the brother low degree. He's not talking about something bad. He's talking about someone that's poor. Someone that may have not have what other people have. So when he's talking about low degree here, but he, he made this statement with him. He said, let him read. Rejoice in that he is exalted. Now that doesn't mean that now he's become rich. Not in the things of the world. He's still poor. He still doesn't have a lot of money. But the Bible didn't say he shall be exalted. The Bible said he is exalted. So we find here that it does not say that it's a bad thing to be poor. And folks, it's not a bad thing to be poor. We'll look at it in a few moments. It's all right to be poor. But I'm talking about poor. What we have here at Temple Baptist Church is working class people. I, uh, we have very few professional people. Every now and then we have what we call professional people in here. Most of you are what they call blue collar workers. You work a job someplace. You earn a living by the sweat of your brow, bending your back. You earned it a dollar at a time. Now, let's look at verse number 10. But 
the rich. Here's the man that's got everything. Rejoice in that he is made low. It doesn't mean that the rich man gives away or loses all of his riches. He didn't say that. He's talking about something different. But notice what he said. Because as the flower of the grass, he shall pass away. And then he talks about the sun burning away, the heat and the dryness and the grace of the fashion. He talks about the rich man fade away in his ways. He's not talking about he's losing anything. He's not talking about the poor man gaining anything. What he's talking about in here is something that's on the inside, not something that's on the outside. Where? Uh, we live in days where men are exalted for whatever reason. There's three virtual ways that you can be exalted. One, because of your position. Two, by your power. Or three, by your possessions. Now, notice Mr. Bezo or Bezo or whatever pronounces his name, the man that's over Amazon, the richest man in the world, made him a rocket and shot up into the outer space and floated around for less than 10 minutes. I have no idea how much it cost him to float around for less than 10 minutes up there, but to him it was just a drop in the bucket and it was something that he wanted to do. He's got position, he's got power, he's got possessions. Now, everybody kind of caters to him because he can help them financially or positionally or in power, in politics or whatever. Uh, he can help people, so what they do is they kind of bow down to him. Now, he likes it. He likes his position, his power, his possessions. He likes all these things. He's not talking about the low man of low degree, and he's not talking down on them. I want you to understand God loves these two men equally. There's nothing wrong with being poor. There's nothing wrong with being rich. God makes some people rich. I knew of a man years ago, he's dead and gone now, that when he got ready to start a business, he promised God, if you'll help my business, I'll give you 90% and I will live on the 10. The man was a multi, multi-millionaire before it was over with. He gave 90% instead of 10%. Somebody said, if you want to be a millionaire, start tithing on it. Well, we find here these two men. Now, we want to take them in their context. Nothing wrong with being rich. Nothing wrong with being poor. So that's not what he's talking about. The Lord said something over in Luke. I want you to turn to Luke 14. And we're going to look at that. And then we'll come back and stay over here in the context. The Lord dealt with this in another fashion over in Luke chapter number 14, because it's something that uh, kind of affects everybody in one way or the other. Chapter 14. I'll give you time to get over there. We're going to read verses 7 down through verse number 11. Very familiar to you, but I want to put it in its context. Verse 7, And he put forth a parable to those which were bidden, when he marked how they chose out the chief rooms. Now, he's evidently watching these Pharisees and these lawyers. Uh, he's been dealing with them quite a bit. And what's happening, he's watching them. When they go in, they sit at the highest room or the highest place, the place where you are exalted. Not long ago, uh, Barbara and I went to a wedding, and uh, we didn't see the signs on there, reserved. And so Barbara and I, I got our food, and uh, we went over and sat down. Oh, you talk an embarrassment. A young lady came up and said, uh, uh, Sir, ma'am, do you mind moving to another table? <laughs> We'd already messed up the dishes on this table. I right? had everything really laid out. And boy, you're talking about an embarrassment. Boy, yeah, we just got, we was, we was looking for one out in the back yard someplace after that. Well, we sat out there and eat. Now, what, what was happening was they were sitting down in the chief rooms in verse number seven. Now, here's what he said to them. When thou art bidden of any man to a wedding, sit not down in the highest room, lest a more honorable man than thou be bidden of him 
And he that bade him, thee and him come and say to thee, Give this man place, and thou begin with shame to take the lowest room. But when thou art bidden, go and sit down in the lowest room. Now, regardless of how high or low you think of yourself, he said, when you come in, you are to take the low room and not the high room. That when he that baiteth thee cometh, he may say unto thee, or he may not. What if he didn't say this? He may say unto thee, friend, go up higher, and thou shalt have worship in the presence of them that sit it meet with thee. He said, regardless of your state, you take the lowest place in there, and it may be that you'll be elevated. If not, at least you're not going to be embarrassed. Now look at verse... Look at verse 11. For whosoever exalteth himself. Now that's what he's talking about in the book of James. Whoever exalteth himself shall be abased, and he that humbleth himself shall be exalted. Now let's go back to the book of James a minute, and I want to give you some things I, 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 I hope it's going to help you, because we're going to look into context a little bit tonight. But we find a, a poor man that's called called the brother of low degree that he is exalted. It tells me that he is elevated up. If he if he had come to that wedding, he would have taken the lowest seat. So he is elevated up. But look at the rich man in verse number 10. But the rich man rejoiced in that he is made low. Now, he wasn't one that sat in the high place. If you go back to the, the Pharisee, uh, go back to the parable. He was a rich man that took the lowest seat. And the Bible said he rejoiced in that he took. So what you've got here is actually a poor man and a rich man, and both of them take the lowest seat. And both of them are exalted at that point. Now, I want to tie it in with the context just for a few minutes tonight. If you go back to verses number two and follow it down, we, we find some things that we've been studying and preaching on. What, what is the great thing about staying low or putting yourself low? You know, the Bible talks about the rich, uh, the poor are rich in faith. And I thank God for that. I, I and there's some millionaires that get saved. There's some real money people that get saved. And I mean, they've got an open book. I remember Jimmy Clark said years ago, <clears throat> he was friends or uh, became friends with a man that was a multimillionaire. You know, multimillionaires have a lot of friends. Everybody wants to be friends with a millionaire. But the millionaire told Jimmy something one day. They were in a church and they were talking and he said, Jimmy, he said, this is what I want you to do. If you ever have a need, he said, I want you to take that need to God in prayer. And I'll be close enough to God that God can tell me if I need to meet that need or not. And what he did, he said a little bit of groundwork there. You know, don't come up to me and, uh, you know, a lot of times preachers are bad about poor mountain. Uh, they come up and they, they kind of uh, ask a, a financial request without asking it. All right, oh, boy, you y'all y'all just pray for us. My car just blew up. My lost my job and I need $10,000 to catch up on my taxes. But y'all just pray for me. What are you doing? He's putting out a little bit of a feeler out there, okay? He's talking about two men here, and both of these men were exalted and both put in a place of rejoicing. Now, I want to take it back, and we're going to run through these verses very quickly, and I want to tie it into these verses. Look at verse number two. My brethren, count it all joy when you fall into divers temptations. When you look at that verse, we find storms, all right? Temptations, this is not temptation to sin. This is a temptation that tries your faith. He's telling that poor man 
and that rich man to both have the same mentality in it. Now, let's go to the poor man. What's he think when he gets to the trials of this life? Listen, he knows life's hard. Life's hard. You know, somebody said uh, uh, poor is not a sin, but it is awfully inconvenient at times. You know, not that. I have not I used to love old Ron Cockrum, and he's with the Lord now. But he used to say he was too broke to pay attention. Uh, he, he had all the, <clears throat> he'd come into church and say, "I'm about as broke as a bandit." You know, he always had these sayings on there. What he's talking about? He's talking to them in light of life. Why is it important that they be like the man that's abased? Because poor people go through problems a whole lot better than the rich people do because of where their trust is. He's telling that poor man, you can't trust in your riches. You don't have them, but you can certainly trust in me to meet that need. He's telling that rich man that you have everything seemingly you need, but you need to put your trust in me and not the things that you've got in your hand. That way, both of these can rejoice when God takes care of the problem for them. So we find that poor people have a tendency to weather storms better than rich people. Boy, these rich people, if the stock market would fail in 1929, you had multimillionaires jumping out of windows of, of, of just committing suicide because of the stock market that fell down. So he's telling them, I want you to have something in your heart to where you're nothing and I become your everything. That's what God wants these two. The man of low degree, the man that's a rich man. He wants them both rejoicing because they know him. Look at verse number two or three. He said, knowing this, that the trying of your faith work of patience. So what do we talk about here? We talk about faith. The trying of your faith. The poor man has more patience than the rich man does because he's used to waiting in line. He's used to not getting what he wants. You know, I found out a long time ago when I found out the world didn't revolve around me that it didn't matter too much what I wanted or what I actually didn't want. Some people, they don't get what they want. Boy, they just blow. But he showed a patience in these people. He wants that rich man to be just as patient. And by the way, it's harder for a rich man. You know, the Bible said it's easier for a camel to go through the eye of the needle than a rich man to enter into the kingdom of heaven. So we find the patience. A rich people, if they think they're rich, if their mind is in that direction, they have an impatience about them. But the poor man... He has the patience to wait because he doesn't have it to start with. So he's waiting for it. Look at verse number four. But let patience have her perfect work that you may per be perfect and entire and wanting nothing. That talks about spiritual maturity. Growing up. God wants you to grow up. God wants that poor man to mature in the Lord. God wants that rich man to mature in the Lord. He wants them both to mature in the Lord. So what he does, he wants them to grow up. Not, again, to have to have everything. Everything's got to come your way. Everything's got to be the way you, you like that. That's not reality. It's how you handle it. It's what's on the inside. It's who your trust is. It's what you think about God. How you put your life in God's hand. But hey, be you poor, be you rich, be you somewhere in between and that's what he's talking about in that verse. Look, look at verse number five. If any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God that giveth to all. Not poor, not rich, but giveth to all men liberally, and upbraideth not, and it shall be given unto him. We trust the Lord. Hey, if you trust the Lord, you get the ear of God. Let him ask of God. Lord, what, how do you want me to react? What do you want me to do? Lord, when you pour, you ask God and you trust God and get the ear of God. I like the old farmer one time, he was, a, he was a praying and they asked him to pray in church. He was a praying man. He just stood up and said, Lord, he said, it's me again. All right? Need to be me again. That rich man, you know what? I dealt with your daily prayer. Pray you, therefore, your daily bread. Every, every day. We don't, we don't have to have that because we've got our, our cupboards full. But you know, I believe we need to pray for our daily bread. 
He gave that. He's talking about your physical needs. He's talking about the things that you need in this life. You know, sometimes you pray about it. And we had to go up to a car place the other day and get something fixed. And uh, uh, listen, I don't need another car. Don't need a new car. Got one that works. Amen. Thank the Lord for that. I praise the Lord for it every day. But we find having the ear of God, asking God to give. He said, ask and you shall receive. He said, knock and it shall be open unto you. He said, seek, find. He gave all these things. He wants both the poor man and the rich man on the same floor with this thing. Wherever your station is in life, whatever you've got, God wants you to come to him asking in faith. And he said, you ask. He said, you receive. So we find in that verse that he wants the two the same. Look at verse number six. Let him ask in faith, nothing wavering. For he that wavereth is like a wave of the sea driven with the wind and tossed. He wants us to have stability. Not blown about by every wind of doctrine. I go back to this stock market. It's, it's up. It's what they call a bull market. If you're not familiar with that, uh, it's real high based on nothing. And basically, that's where it is. I, I am shocked. I figured when Joe Biden got in, it dropped 10,000 points. But it's actually gone up 4,000 points when he's bankrupting our nation. And that tells me these people on Walmart are not seeing the things that we're seeing down here. All right. We see down here, we see that our uh, milk and eggs, our dairy products are up 8% in most states. Meat is up 7% in most states. That is super high inflation for just a few months. And that's all this has been. And so what happens is they're seeing one thing up here, and I think they've got the blinders on. I think they're seeing wrong. They ought to be seeing the way we're seeing. Yeah. You're going to run into a you're going to run into a brick wall down here eventually. Everybody knows that. I hope they know that. Uh, when we were on vacation not long ago, uh, Barbara and I, and two of the <coughs> other older couples, got on the elevator together. And what did we do? We discussed politics. But what we found out was that all three of us older couples were on the same page. Now notice what he said in here. He said, let him ask in faith, nothing wavering. God doesn't want that poor man driven by the things that are going on. Listen, he doesn't have a whole lot. He doesn't, he's not to put his faith in the economy tonight. He's not to put his faith in Wall Street. He's not to put his faith in the government. I notice they're coming out now. They've got another shop for Delta. Hey, before, before it's over with, you're going to have to have about 25 shots before this thing gets over with to take care of it. That's, the, that's kind of the pattern that they're building up in here. Listen, God doesn't want you to worry about that. Now, I'm not saying don't take the shots. You do whatever you want to. That, that's personal business. But what he's saying is he wants them to trust God when the wind starts blowing in a different direction. I don't know what's going to happen in our nation, but I think it's going to be bad. I really do. I think it's going to be bad. I think, uh, if, and I don't think it's going to be too long. I believe irreparable damage is being done right now. Things that we'll never, we'll never get through over. It. We'll never get over these things. So he wants that poor man not to be wavering, but even the rich man has a more opportunity to waver than he does because he's got more to lose. What if God took everything that you had today away from you? You ever thought about that? You just lost it all. Let me tell you, it would be all right. That's where God wants these two men to stand. Look at verse number 11. Let not that man think that he shall receive anything of the Lord. If you want to receive something of God, you've got to have stability in your life. He talked about that double-minded man being unstable. Now, I want to get back down to our verses and we're going to go home. He said, now, you let that brother of low degree that's not a bad place. That is not a derogatory term. It simply means that he doesn't have a lot of the things of the world, but he's got a God that's big enough to take care of him. He said, you rejoice in that God's going to meet your needs. God's going to exalt you. God's going to take you up. 
When this is all said and done, I like what old Herb Williamson said years ago. He said it may get so bad that there's only one uh, slice of bread in, in Sturgis, Kentucky. But he said this preacher is going to be nibbling on one corner of it. I heard him make that statement one time. All right? He's talking about a heart condition here. Not just a money condition, but a heart condition that this man rejoices because he's exalted. He doesn't have what everybody else does, and yet he does have what everybody else does. Listen, you may not have a T-bone steak for supper tonight, but if you've got a bologna sandwich, you do, you right well. Today I fixed a salami and cheese sandwich with Duke's mayonnaise on it. I cut the bread in half. I like this New York rye. Anybody eat that? Oh, that's some good rye bread. It's got all the seeds. It's got everything in there. Cut that thing in half. Put Duke's mayonnaise. Put a piece of salami on it. A piece of cheese on it. And get some wavy potato chips and sit down. And you got a meal going on. Listen, I would rather have a cheeseburger than a steak dinner. Anybody else here like cheeseburger? Oh, yeah, look at them kids. Man, that's popping them hands up. Boy, I like to go buy McDonald's and get one of those little double cheeseburgers. It used to be on the dollar menu. Now it's about $1.49 or 69 or something. If I was a truck driver, I'd weigh 500 pounds. I'd stop by one get me 20 of them. I'd get me a sack of them things, and I'd get me a great big gallon of this. <laughs> Some of your green tea, they bad, and I believe I could make it down the road with it. He's talking about a heart condition. In verse number 10, he's talking or uh, 10, he's talking to that rich man that he's to have the same heart condition as that low man does. Though he's not everything, he needs to treat it before God as if he has nothing. And let God take care of his needs instead of his bank account taking care of his needs. And I'm not against bank accounts tonight. I'm not against you having money. I thank God for that. If you put up something for old age, God bless your heart. Hey, you're, one of these days you're going to probably need it, and then it'll be there, and it'll take care of you. But he talked about let both of these individuals rejoice. Now, look at verse number 11. We're going home. Now he's going to talk to both of them. You know, there's a possibility of that poor man wishing he was rich. And there's also a possibility of that rich man glad that he's rich. Now he's going to deal with the riches. For the sun is no sooner risen with a burning heat. Boy, when that sun comes up, things change. But it withereth the grass. You notice your grass lately? We got three inches of rain the other night. Thank God for that. Our grass is not growing. The sun's burning it up. This time of the year, we get into what I call the dog days of summer. Dog days of summer, everything is taking a beating by the sun and by the dryness. He said, for the sun no sooner is risen with burning heat, but it withereth the grass and the flower thereof falleth. And the grace of the fashion of it perisheth away. Now notice the last part of that verse. So also shall the rich man fade away, not in his money, but in his rich ways. He said, if you're trusting in uncertain riches, they'll eventually make wings. And they'll fly away. What does God want? God wants us to be content where we are and learn our lessons well. Put our trust in him. I believe in these last days we're going to have to learn trust God for some things. Just going to have to trust God. Sometime you're getting older, you're going to have to trust God with your health. You're going to have to do that. That's hard sometimes. You're going to have to trust God with you. You're going to have to trust God with your finances, with your retirement, with what you're doing. You've got to trust God. And he said then the man of low degree and the rich man can rejoice together. Just stand tonight and we won't have an invitation.